Okay, I think we're we're just past the top of the hour, so I think we could uh, we could go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to uh, Center for Blood Research seminar series, and I'm very uh, happy to be able to introduce to you Dr. Dean Ferguson. Uh, Dean is a senior scientist and also the director of the clinical epidemiology program at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Uh, Dean's uh, got associations with a number of departments at, uh, at the U of O, but uh, particularly with the School of Epidemiology and Public Health. What I would um, like to just mention is that uh, Dean is, is also a, an adjunct scientist with Canadian Blood Services. And he's done a lot of really uh, impressive clinical trial work in the field of transfusion medicine uh, amongst other areas. But he, I've asked him to come speak with us today about some very interesting work that, that his uh, institute and he and his colleagues have been doing, looking at the characteristics of blood donors and how they may have an impact on uh, recipient uh, outcomes from the transfusions. So Dean, I'm gonna let you take over and do your slide sharing and the um, floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Dana. You can see my slides? We can. Great, yeah, thank you very much, Dana. And thank you for, for the invite to the seminar series. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and, and speak to you all. Um, I also think, uh, thank uh, Christine and, and Mira for helping organize and testing and so forth. So this will hopefully go smoothly or at least uh, it should go smoothly. Um, really appreciate that. So yeah, my, my name is Dean Ferguson. I'm, uh, I'm a scientist at, at the Ottawa Hospital and I've been working in the transfusion realm for well over 25 years, mostly clinical trials and systematic reviews. And, uh, and a lot of my work has uh, uh, led to, to sort of clinical trials and, and sort of that, that evidence-based approach to transfusion medicine. So I'm going to talk, as, as Dana said, about donor characteristics. Uh, in particular, I'm really going to focus on, on both donor uh, sex and donor age and uh, their impact on recipient uh, mortality. Um, just for the sake of uh, time and so forth, we'll, we'll narrow it down just to mortality, sort of the big outcome. And uh, I'm just going to lead you through a bit of background work from the uh, sort of some, some early lab stuff uh, that we uh, use to help justify uh, our observational and clinical trials. And then I'll get into the observational and clinical trial work. So just for disclosures, I have no, no financial interests or disclosures to make. Academic-wise, uh, I've received funding from both Canadian Blood Services and, and CIHR to conduct uh, both the observational study as, as well as uh, our ITADS clinical trial with looking at donor sex. So as I mentioned, uh, a long sort of history looking at transfusion epidemiology and, and, and a big part of that looking at how we can optimize the the red blood cell product, uh, starting with some work on leuk reduction and the role of leuk reduction uh, on, on patient uh, outcomes, both in neonates as well as uh, adult uh, critical care populations. And uh, that then fed into looking at the issue of, of uh, storage age and, and uh, how that may affect the RBC product. So looking at sort of fresh versus usual care or, or stored uh, red cells. And it's that work, uh, looking at the uh, age of storage, that, that led to looking at the age of, uh, of donors. And, and when presenting the age of storage work, people uh, you know, were commenting, well, and as most of you will know, there's really nothing there in terms of uh, uh, storage age having a imp clinical impact on, on, uh, on recipients. And, and so, people started asking the question, well, maybe it's not storage age, maybe it's donor age, or, or maybe it's you know, manufacturing characteristics or, or donor sex and so forth. So that started uh, myself and, and another group locally at the Ottawa Hospital uh, with, with a PhD student going down the road of, of okay, well, let's see what's, what's out there in, 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 in the literature on what, what donor characteristics uh, sex and age in particular may affect recipient outcome. 
And um, we weren't the only ones doing this, obviously. Uh, others were, were thinking about it and, and, and working on it. And this sort of culminated in uh, uh, you know, the NIH State of Science uh, Symposium that I, I took part in, uh, in, in Bethesda. And uh, at the symposium, uh, they wanted to uh, identify among uh, panels of experts, as well as the audience, try to identify what are the main research questions and uh, sort of unanswered questions that the transfusion medicine research community could focus on going forward. And during that, uh, so they're broken down into different committees, usually around uh, the blood product uh, or, or characteristics within that blood product. And one of the overarching themes uh, was uh, sort of that what's in the bag, uh, what's in the bag in terms of red blood cells and, and their quality and, and uh, and the variability in the products and so forth, and, uh, and wh whether that matters. And uh, trying to identify factors or, or characteristics that may matter to, to recipients. And in particular, under that theme, they were interested in donor factors, such as uh, uh, age and gender, as well as processing and manufacturing methods. And so that gave sort of even further justification for, for pursuing pursuing this work. And currently, uh, we know that, that you know, donor selection does matter and optimal selection of blood donors certainly helps uh, improve the safety of, of our blood products and the current screening protocols, uh, you know, excluding specific populations that may be at risk or have at risk conditions or behaviors through questionnaires. Um, we do this uh, routinely, or the blood system does this routinely now. And so, and added to that, that in specific uh, uh, blood products that we actually limit uh, donor characteristics uh, uh, to improve the uh, recipient outcome. And that, uh, the example of uh, plasma or frozen plasma made, made only from male donors. So once that donor criteria is applied, we still see great variability in, in, in the R, R, sort of the RBC product or, or what's in the bag. And, and certainly uh, the CVR and, and others have spent uh, an impressive amount of time and, and research looking at the, well, not only the quality of what's in the bag, but, but novel methods to look at what's in the bag. And so, you know, all that work has shown that there's still variability, even looking at levels of homolysis and so forth, there's still a, a, a bunch of variability that's sort of otherwise, uh, that needs to be explained. And so it's here that we're, we're gonna pick up, you know, donor sex and, and donor age as, as potential factors that may affect uh, the quality of what's in the bag and the downstream effects of what happens in recipients. So what's out there in terms of the lab-based data? Like I said, focusing on donor sex and, and, and age. Uh, what, what lab data can we use to justify uh, um, you know, pursuing uh, clinical work in this area or clinical research in this area? Well, there hap happens to be a bunch of, of work that's done in the area. This is just a, a, a small selection of all the work out there that shows that donor age can affect uh, RBCs as well as donors, donor sex can affect. And with donor age, uh, you know, sort of decreased uh, erythrocyte precursors, increased DNA damage, increased cytokine levels, all with uh, increasing with donor age. And then donor sex, uh, largely, you know, just the composition of, uh, of the uh, RBCs, the, the antigens involved, the hormones involved, and, uh, and their, their potential effects on, on uh, the RBC product. So, you know, again, this is a, a selected, uh, uh, you know, a selection of what's out there. There's also data out there that, that suggests that um, that they don't really play a role in in impacting RBCs. So, with this, um, we sort of categorized, uh, uh, you know, how uh, how these in vitro studies could could show that there that certain characteristics may affect. Uh, the quality of the product, and this is just a characterization, actually largely based on the work by Zunakis, uh, published in 2016, and we kind of just 
created uh, columns and plugged in uh, various uh, donor characteristics that may, may play a role. So taking this forward, uh, oh, and, and sorry, I have one other slide here. This is a recent work uh, by the Red 3 group, uh, really impressive work with large collaboration, multi-institutional, multi-hospital uh, collaboration, where they looked at, uh, they were interested in looking at uh, different changes to the product uh, and its interaction with storage age. And what's produced here, what's in table two is looking at, uh, stored blood for 39 to 42 days, uh, looking at the effects uh, of uh, different uh, hemolysis, uh, uh, markers of hemolysis or, or, or uh, potential sources of hemolysis, I should say, between males and females and showing uh, uh, dramatic uh, differences in terms of uh, statistical significance between males and females, again, focused on older uh, storage aged RBCs. So armed with all this data, we then went looking for uh, uh, the, the sort of clinical impact of, of both donor sex and donor age. And uh, here we turn to observational studies, uh, published observational studies. And at the time, taking back to 2014, 15, there was only one study um, uh, that, that we found um, uh, one large study by Middleburg and, and colleagues uh, looking at uh, uh, donor recipient compatibility and showing over, overall, I'm, I'm just, Dana, can you see my, my pointer? Okay, great, thanks. So in looking at all recipients over time uh, at, uh, uh, using a, a transfusion, uh, 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 hospital-based transfusion registry matched up with clinical data over time, looking at mortality that among all recipients of transfusions, that those uh, receiving uh, blood or RBCs from female donors uh, fared uh, worse compared to the male donors. And it seemed to be, oh, it seemed to be the mismatch of female blood to male recipients making up most of that uh, 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 difference between female and male donors. So that was the one study, uh, large observational study, um, you know, certain risks, risk, uh, risk of bias associated with it that, that I'll get into to later. Uh, but it prompted us to uh, look at our own data within the Ottawa hospital and so we looked at it uh, and, and published that work in, in uh, 2015 as well, or 2016, I should say. And uh, this was largely built off our transfusion infrastructure, transfusion data infrastructure that we built at the Ottawa Hospital that had the ability to look at the donor recipient continuum uh, by tapping in and working with uh, uh, Canadian Blood Services. So the blood coming to the door, once it's at the door of the hospital, we could follow it through the system uh, into the patients and then follow those patients longitudinally. So that's exactly what we did in this study. And uh, I'll go through a bit of the methods. It was a retrospective longitudinal study and, and longitudinal aspect is really important here because we're not just taking first time recipients, but any recipient that, that entered in 2006, October, 2006, followed over time until December, 2013. If they had multiple uh, entries into the hospital, we followed, uh, we, we captured that data as well. So it was all folk between 2006 and 2013 that re had received at least one uh, allogeneic RBC transfusion at any one of our four campuses at the Ottawa hospital. And, uh, and the data collection was from our data warehouse. So that data transfusion data mart that we created in within the warehouse, linking with CBS donor data, putting that together and then linking with uh, ISIS, uh, which is a provincial, uh, uh, a or provincial uh, um, sort of um, a registry for, for, for patient and administrative data. And uh, they, they bring in all sources of data from, from medical billings to, to, uh, to social services, to immigration, everything under the sun, under, under, one, uh, under one roof. And uh, 
we could link up our hospital data with ISIS data to get that longitudinal aspect of patients either uh, uh, entering another hospital or, or dying outside of the hospital or being diagnosed with an MI outside of hospital at another hospital. So we linked all that up and uh, our primary outcome was looking at survival, time to, uh, time to death. Our secondary outcomes were, were time to uh, new cancer occurrence and some infectious uh, markers, C. diff and MRSA, because those have been well validated within our Ottawa Hospital data set, as well as myocardial infarction and, and, uh, and a couple other uh, secondary outcomes, such as uh, the need for dialysis. So in total, we had 30, uh, over that uh, approximately eight year period, we had 30,500 recipients, uh, close to 81,000 donors, uh, 187 or close to 188,000 transfused units. And the mean follow-up from the first transfusion uh, was about 2.3 years. And so we had people in there for the full eight years of follow-up and obviously the, the, patient, the patients at the, in the last few days of our, our period only contributed those, those few days. Our over mortal, overall mortality was 43%, which was fairly shocking in the sense of th this is what lends itself uh, that why the longitudinal component is, is important because if we took overall mortality for a transfused cohort just within their first initial stay, it's probably sitting at about uh, 10 to 15 percent. But if you follow them over time, uh, the mortality was 43 percent. And so what did we show? Well, we showed in terms of uh, 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 donor sex um, that the, the, the male donors fair, uh, uh, receiving uh, uh, donations from uh, male donors, you fared better than from female. And so what's, what's on here is the days from first transfusion. So when you first got into this study all the way out to an eight, possible eight years, uh, looking at the survival probability from 100% down to 0%. And if we took the study mean, uh, because the, the sort of fancy or elaborate analysis is actually uh, uh, um, um, is accounting for the number of units in your time from one unit to the, to the next, and depending on what that next unit is, male, female, et cetera, uh, it's, it's hard to produce graphs. Uh, you have to set the number of transfusions as your, your comparator. So what we have here is a mean of six transfusions, which was the overall study mean. So a mean of six units in, in male donors uh, from the blue line and from the red or salmon colored line is six units from females. And over time, you see that uh, you know, there's some early separation and over time that uh, males, uh, 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 the male donated blood feel, fared better in recipients than female. So another way of portraying this data is looking at the number of units uh, transfused. I showed you six. Um, this is the baseline risk for males, so male recipients, and, uh, and or sorry, ma male donations, I should say, and the number of units received. And so you can see the increasing uh, uh, mortality uh, and hazard ratios, the more no, no transfusions you receive, which, which makes sense because it, it's, uh, it's also a potential confounding factor that the more transfusions you receive, the more sicker you are or will be. And then compared to female, the hazard ratios are even more enhanced. And so it's the relative of receiving female blood, it's that relative uh, hazard ratios across uh, or down this spectrum compared to this spectrum that gives you this difference over the cumulative number of units, males uh, uh, having a lower hazard ratio than females uh, represented in the previous slide where, where male donors, uh, recipients of male donate blood fared better. So now the same with, with, with age, I'm just gonna move that. So here, just for, for uh, uh, displaying purposes, we, we categorize age less than 30, greater than 30, and that we actually found that, that those, were, those uh, recipients receiving younger blood actually fared worse than, uh, uh, than those receiving 
uh, RBCs from older donors. And again, here, breaking down to less than 30, over 30 uh, uh, donors, you can see the hazard ratios over time uh, for less than 30 increased with the number of units uh, uh, more rapidly than those for over 30, uh, uh, donors of over 30 years of age. And here again is just uh, another representation taking a mean of six uh, transfusions that you have the different categories of age broken down into deciles or decades that uh, the middle part between 30 and 70, there's really nothing going on between either the unadjusted or adjusted. But once you hit greater than 70, there was a reduction in mortality and an increase in mortality, the hazards of mortality less than 30. So sort of overall conclusions from, from that data are that from the Ottawa data at least is a reduced survival uh, uh, after RBC transfusion from female donors and young donors. And uh, certainly this was an evidence that it's causal. Um, we still need to nail down the sort of exact mechanisms, uh, more on that later, as well as, uh, you know, it's, it's clear that donor sex and age could be proxies, uh, you know, additional confounding could, could be going on and, and sex and age are just representative of, of different effects. With donor age, it could be the healthy donor effect, uh, most likely that if you're still donating into your 70s that you're uh, 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 relatively, uh, more healthy than, than the general population or than the population of, of younger donors where that is not uh, all being teased out. Okay, so we, we published that data and then there was uh, quickly ad additional observational studies that were well underway started to be published. And I'll, I'll just take you through some of that. So a nice paper by Karim uh, Dilder and, and uh, Rutger uh, uh, Middleberg, uh, looking at a large, again, a large cohort of over 42,000 patients uh, in, in six hospitals in the Netherlands. Uh, their exposure was uh, not necessarily donor sex, but, but looking at uh, uh, ever pregnant or never pregnant female donors compared compare to male donors. And here they found that if you take the, uh, there's two, it's actually three cohorts here. We'll fir first focus on the no donor mixture cohort. So this is where uh, uh, recipients received only male or only female. So if you looked at, at that cohort, um, that in relation to uh, 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 male, um, uh, for males receiving ever pregnant uh, uh, female blood, had an increased risk of 13% in their hazard ratios. Whereas looking at the female recipients, there really was no effect of ever pregnant or never pregnant. When looking at the full cohort, so mixing and matching uh, recipients receiving, uh, uh, you know, uh, different male and, and female RBC products, the, that, uh, that effect held up in terms of the, uh, uh, in both in the ever pregnant and never pregnant analysis, where there still was an increased risk of receiving female blood in the male recipients. And, and again, really no difference in the uh, female recipients of female blood, regardless of, of pregnancy status. So this is pointing towards that the donor mismatch may, may be at play, not necessarily the donor sex. There's a, a, another study in the cardiac population, a large retrospective uh, study of cardiac surgery patients in two French hospitals. And overall that they found uh, no effect of donor sex or mismatch, uh, although it was largely un underpowered for, for looking at uh, the bigger clinical outcomes such as mort mortality. So nothing really definitive could be said, but overall they concluded that there was really no effect of either donor sex or sex mismatch. And then an incredibly large study uh, uh, by uh, Edgren and colleagues of uh, an incredibly robust uh, uh, and rich data set in, in both Sweden and Denmark, 
uh, a well, very well done study looking at uh, close to a million transfusions between 2003 and 2012, uh, robust analysis, uh, more to come on that, uh, but they found really nothing there. So they're, they're looking at donor age and donor sex and in the million transfusions that they looked at and or a million transfusions and the recipients really found uh, uh, nothing uh, in terms of uh, any impact, maybe a little bit of impact that, that we saw with the donors over age of 70. So they had their own analytic method. They also applied our Ottawa method, slight differences, uh, and it's, it's almost too complicated to, to, to describe, uh, but both fairly robust methods are sort of the most robust available to, to analyze uh, uh, observational data. So again, a large, very robust study uh, uh, showing no effect of either age or donor sex. Then along comes uh, the Hamilton Group and Nancy Heddle and colleagues uh, looking at, again, a very large data set uh, of hospitalized adult patients. So all comers, just uh, much like ours was, they had over 25,000 patients, close to 100,000 transfusions. Uh, and, and again, only the data from first admissions or first transfusions were included. And uh, they nicely set up their analysis into a series of questions. And here uh, in, in the models presented in A is do, you, do younger donors, uh, don't you, younger donor RBCs cause harm? And so here their reference uh, category was uh, donors over 54 years of age, and then they had comparisons. I think they broke it down into quartiles. So they looked at donors 17 to 30, 31 to 45, and 46 to 54. And here are the hazard ratios looking at mortality. And so 17 to 30 year olds compared to over 54 year olds had an increased risk, uh, non-statistically significant, uh, and, uh, but uh, uh, clinically significant increased risk uh, as to did uh, the 31 to 45 uh, uh, year category and nothing in the 46 to 54, pretty, pretty much no. And then breaking it down into sort of dichotomizing greater than 45 versus 17 to 45, obviously that risk still held. And then looking at uh, donor sex, uh, so model B, do female donor RBCs cause harm? The reference here is uh, exclusive to male donors. So that's the reference. And they found that uh, female recipients exposed to female donor RBCs compared to only male actually decreased the risk, but there was increased uh, risk in the male uh, uh, population, male recipient population. And again, they broke it down into do female donors RBC cause harm? The reference here is exposure to exclusively female donor RBCs. And again, uh, female to, to, to female showed increase, uh, sorry, female to male uh, RBCs in, in, uh, showed increased risk and male recipients of male donor did not. So that's largely the observational evidence. And uh, it was uh, nicely summarized in, in a, uh, a, a recent review, looking at the sex mismatch. So not, uh, not sex specifically, but in the, in the uh, uh, sex mismatch uh, uh, by Mickey Zeller and colleagues uh, again at Hamilton. And uh, they took those five studies that looked at six match, uh, sex mismatch, the Middleburg study, the cardiac study by Desmarais, and uh, three additional studies, including their own, and came up with an overall, so a pooled result, uh, looking at mortality, that a sex match was better than a sex mismatch, okay? So five, five retrospective observational studies being pooled together, uh, close to uh, or over 86,000 patients. And uh, uh, obviously they showed the higher risk of, of death and sex, mis sex mismatch. But we also know that uh, within the studies, there's a large amount of heterogeneity, cardiac versus all comers. 
some of the uh, analysis to produce the, the final results were, were different between the studies. And, and like any transfusion observational study, those risks of bias, of, of selection bias, and, and also misclass, misclassification are fairly high. And so just to add to that, uh, 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 Mickey's systematic review uh, uh, is the most sort of up-to-date that I know of. We published one uh, a little while back in, in, uh, in, to, in 2015, and uh, uh, it includes obviously some of what uh, uh, the previous review was getting at. We also looked at uh, uh, donor age. So in terms of donor age, just in addition to, to that previous review, we found five studies. Uh, only one looked at mortality. The other four looked at uh, the association with Prawley. Um, and the one that looked at mortality, it sure showed that if you take the, the, uh, the oldest donor age unit, that a maximum donor age of 6.24 years older in patients who survived. So if you look at the survivors and who didn't and picked out the maximum uh, donor age, it was about 6.24 years difference. A ton of confounding, a ton of uh, uh, sort of analytic issues uh, uh, with that, uh, but that's, that was sort of the state of the art in terms of donor age uh, until, uh, until the, the, the up large observational studies started being produced. So uh, just a couple quick words on, on the analysis of transfusion data. Now I put on sort of my methodologist hat and uh, if I've learned anything over the last uh, 25 plus years working in transfusion epidemiology is that uh, we, we still struggle with these issues. And uh, it certainly ain't easy when you have a, uh, a cohort of transfused uh, patients, Never mind. Here we're dealing with all transfused and looking at donor characteristics between, uh, between subjects or recipients. Uh, like I say, it ain't easy. Multiple transfusions, multiple donor characteristics, uh, uh, age, sex, manufacturing, blood type, uh, et cetera. We're trying to capture transfusions and outcomes over time. Uh, it's easy to, to you know, take the first transfusion or the first episode, but what we've shown is a really, really important to follow them over time. You then have donor-donor interactions, so age and sex interactions. You have donor-recipient interactions, again, age and sex, the sex mismatch is a good example of that. And then you, on top of all that, you have other risk factors at the recipient level in terms of, uh, you know, uh, case acuity and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, medical versus surgical, ICU versus outpatient, et cetera. And then you also have other risk factors at the donor level. So uh, those known or unknown uh, risk factors that, that uh, have either, either been measured or, or not measured. So putting all that together is, is incredibly difficult and uh, how, how to analyze is incredibly difficult. I give this example of, uh, you know, three different patients. Uh, if we're trying to isolate donor age, uh, patient one has received three units, uh, patient two, five units, and patient three, one unit, uh, all units with different donor ages. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, sorry. And so patient, oh my gosh, there we go. I won't touch it anymore. Um, yeah, so patient one, uh, you know, I'm just making up data here. Obviously, uh, hopefully they're over uh, 17 years of age to donate. Uh, but as you see, I'm just acknowledging that now as we go. But as an example, if we take the median uh, 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 donor age, uh, patient one would, would be considered uh, the oldest. If we took patient two, um, it would be the average. They would be... Uh, sitting at 12.6, the oldest would be 22 uh, if, we, if we took that. And then patient three receiving just the, the one unit of, uh, from a donor that's, that's 23, they would capture all uh, categories. And clearly uh, this patient would not be different than say patient two uh, or patient one. And so how do you tease all that out? How do you account for the different ages? Uh, 
uh, never mind other uh, characteristics uh, in your analysis. And then the, 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 the answer is actually, I, I don't think you can. You can, you can try, and, and certainly we've tried, others tried with very, very robust uh, and exotic uh, or, uh, analytic methods. I just don't think you can. And uh, uh, so it, it's, it's one of the two big issues. Uh, so defining your, your treatment or exposure, incredibly difficult in transfusion studies. And the second is that confounding by indication meaning the more units you receive uh, that can be from different donor characteristics, uh, the, the sicker you likely are. And so it's, it's very hard to compare patients to receive one versus you know, getting more than, than 10 units. So uh, uh, those two uh, issues lead us to uh, the need for randomized trials because randomized trials overcome both of these biases and both of these issues. We can uh, fix the treatment groups, young versus old, male versus female. And uh, in terms of the confounding by indication, that should be taken care of with randomization that known and unknown confounders would likely be balanced. So with that in mind, uh, we took the uh, uh, evidence from uh, obviously the lab-based evidence and the observational study evidence, and we developed the ITADS protocol. And the, the ITADS is a registry-based uh, 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 randomized trial looking at uh, donor sex. And uh, we, we published the, the protocol along with the full statistical analytic plan in BMJ Open uh, uh, a couple months ago. And uh, we're actually at a stage where we're starting to analyze, and I'll, I'll get to that in, in a couple of slides. So our primary objective, again, was to look at a, a transfusion strategy or policy of male donor uh, uh, only versus female, and whether that improved uh, uh, survival uh, or, or time to improve time to death. Our secondary objectives were looking at male and, and female donors and, and the impact on, on recipient morbidities. Uh, looking at uh, uh, you know infection and end or organ damage uh, uh, via dialysis or myocardial infarction, we also wanted to assess the the impacts of male versus female donors on major patient subgroups. Uh, the biggest probably being recipient sex, but also you know whether they were in intensive care, whether they were oncology patients, or, or receiving uh, major surgery or not. And then the third uh, uh, factor was to help build capacity to conduct these large sort of registry-based pragmatic trials. And uh, so this trial sort of paved the way in working, integrating these large trials within the hospital or health system. It was multi-site, uh, four sites at the Ottawa Hospital, uh, as the same sites that were involved in our, our uh, observational study. Uh, double line pragmatic, uh, again, looking at male only versus female only, donor only. We took all hospitalized uh, recipients uh, uh, needing an RBC transfusion, and actually it wasn't just hospitalized, it was also outpatient, anybody within the hospital receiving a transfusion. Our exclusion criteria was the activation of a massive transfusion protocol, uh, just because of its uh, impact on, on the transfusion service. And uh, um, so we, um, uh, it was just too much of a burden on the transfusion service. So we removed those patients, as well as those with a, a rare or complex antibodies uh, where it was impossible to match with a particular unit. Randomization, we created a electronic uh, uh, web-based randomization platform right in the transfusion service. It was uh, uh, minimal uh, uh, data was required to enter the system. Um, and when RBCs were requested by the uh, physicians or clinical team, uh, the technologist logged into the, the computer uh, and uh, entered a brief survey of patient data just to check eligibility. And then uh, that system right beside the inventory system uh, was uh, uh, given a code and uh, that patient was in uh, uh, that code, color code uh, was either male or female uh, 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 transfusion or RBC products. Blinding, um, so luckily donor sex is, or 
not on the RBC unit labels, or at least can't be deciphered from the unit labels by just looking at them. So everyone was blinded, um, including uh, study staff and study subjects, as well as the transfusion service staff. Uh, but to help allocate or identify and allocate, uh, we worked with CBS to uh, uh, have a color coding system uh, using orange and green and, and uh, develop stickers, orange and green stickers to stick on the, uh, 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 the RBC units once they came into uh, our, our transfusion service and uh, were put in, in the fridges. And so the transfusion uh, personnel identified and applied color-coded uh, study uh, labels to each unit uh, from the provided list uh, from CBS. It was, uh, so it was only identified as orange and green on the, on the list and they applied those stickers. And so nobody knew uh, except the independent statistician and the keepers of the code at, at uh, Canadian Blood Services. Our outcomes were, were two years survival or sort of two, uh, two years plus survival because we went a bit over two years to two years and three months to be exact. Uh, secondary outcomes were, uh, were breaking down mortality into to earlier segments, length of stay, health system costs, and uh, uh, markers of end, end stage, uh, or, or end stage uh, organ disease, as well as new cancer or recurrence of cancer. We aimed for 8,850 patients, and this was based on, I'll draw you to this line, uh, from our observational work that was, was uh, gonna show a 2% difference uh, in, in mortality, an absolute difference of 30% uh, uh, mortality in female versus 28% of mortality, or in, in males, I should say. So a 2% overall uh, uh, risk difference. And we built in a 11% non-compliance factor. We originally had this at 3% and required about 8,000 patients. And then halfway through, we realized our non-compliance was a bit more than 3%. It was uh, uh, close to 11%. And uh, so we revised the, the sample size. It's a registry-based trial, so it relied on all data routinely collected at the Ottawa Hospital and put in the, the data warehouse. Uh, it was then matched up, and then we'll match up with Canadian Blood Services for the donor data. And then once these two are matched up, we will match up with the provincial repository, ISIS, and they will uh, look at recipient outcomes captured outside of the Ottawa Hospital. And so they'll, ISIS uh, will conduct the final analysis. We had waived consent uh, because we argued that uh, the, the risk was minimal. These are everyday standard products. Uh, they didn't uh, uh, rely on, uh, there's no difference between male and female products, as well as it to sort of the impracticability of, uh, of uh, enrolling everyone eligible because this was a policy uh, initiative or a strategy, and it would have been impossible for every uh, uh, sort of clinical personnel to approach every patient and, and enter them into the study. So we were granted that by, by CBS and, uh, and uh, the Ottawa Hospital uh, uh, RABs. And uh, we, we started in uh, September of 2018. And, uh, and because of the wave consent, we notified all study participants uh, because they obviously to get in the study, they needed an RBC transfusion. So with, with their uh, transfusion, transfusion notice, we sent a notice with the ITAD study uh, stating that they could withdraw at any time if they didn't want to be involved and which only uh, two studies out of the 8,852, uh, two patients I should say, actually withdrew their data. They have families on behalf of that patient. Um, and then we also created a website for, for patients that we linked into that letter that they could get further information on the trial and, and contact information. So some preliminary results. I, uh, I was really hoping to present the between group data. Uh, we're rushing. I only got the data on Saturday um, or Friday night, I should say. And so I pieced some of it together. Um, hopefully I'll be invited back to, to present the between group uh, uh, analysis. But a bit on our preliminary results, we actually randomized 8,882 patients, uh, randomized and transfused patients. 
We've just analyzed the uh, baseline characteristics and the co-interventions and outcome data are being analyzed as we speak. And uh, uh, the holdup has been, uh, we've been done since uh, mid-March or, or beginning of Mar yeah, mid-March. The holdup has been uh, working with ISIS and the, uh, the privacy office and the data sharing agreements. They couldn't start until we were done. And so that's been a, a slower process than we thought. But uh, last Friday, we actually received privacy office approval from ISIS. And now we're uh, going through about two weeks of uh, hopefully getting the data sharing agreement done. So overall, I'll show you some of the compliance. Again, 8,882 patients uh, randomized. Uh, compliance was pretty darn good. Uh, close to 90% compliance for all units. Uh, note that the initial encounters were about 22% of the, the uh, units transfused. All those follow-up uh, stays for the, for the patients enrolled in our trial accounted for 78% of transfusions. So it gives you an idea that transfused population or, or, or a good segment of them are repeat, repeat customers and they receive a lot of RBC units. So at the patient level, we, we had about 90% compliance. At the unit level, uh, so breaking it down to the units that those patients received is about 93% um, for the initial and about 87, yeah, 87% 87 for all those subsequent units. We also looked at compliance uh, uh, overall, but also those achieving 75 and 100% compliance. And those for 75%, was, uh, was uh, about 88%, 100% compliance, so male only, female throughout your entire stay or stays was at 76%. Some of the baseline results, uh, uh, again, this is just an aggregate because we need to break the color code uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the between group, but uh, overall, uh, about half, uh, just over half were female. So we'll be able to look at that subgroup of sex uh, mismatch very well because it's almost split right down the middle. Um, mean age of uh, about 67. As expected, a good chunk were inpatient, about 80%. Uh, 11 patients were outpatient, 11% were outpatients. And surgical patients, so of the inpatients, made up about 42% uh, and the critical care uh, Critical care population uh, was also, uh, it's, uh, there's overlap with the, anyway, yeah, the critical care population was, was uh, uh, close to, uh, to over 30%. In terms of, uh, again, I can only present the aggregate data because uh, that's all I have. In terms of RBC units per patient, uh, uh, heavily transfused, about six, uh, about just over five units. Transfusion episodes was about three, or just over three for any individual. And uh, here we see the units per episode. So not all were receiving single uh, transfusion, single RBC transfusions, sitting at about 1.6. And again, the setting was largely inpatient for, for their first transfusion episode. What happens after uh, did, did vary. So that's some of the aggregate transfusion data. And then just to describe the next steps, we need uh, to, to contact uh, Canadian Blood Services to unblind uh, the green and orange. I think Dr. Sheffield is, a, is the keeper of that. Um, we need to do the between group analyses, that final linkage. So between group in hospital analyses, doing that final linkage with, with CBS and ISIS for the out-of-hospital data, then obviously write up and, and submit the manuscript. So hopefully the ITADS trial is designed to provide uh, robust, generalizable audit, uh, evidence because it's taking all comers uh, and offers uh, the, uh, you know, the ideal circumstance to conduct uh, subgroup analyses, uh, but hopefully we'll have an answer of whether uh, uh, donor sex or donor sex mismatch matters. So just a quick slide on the power of registry trials. That was our third aim of the ITADS trial. It's, it's a powerful platform uh, using uh, current data systems, both within transfusion uh, uh, services 
as well as the Ottawa hospitals to build randomization and data capture. We did this at a fraction of a cost of an individualized, uh, individually randomized trial where your individual consent and follow up and all the uh, nursing and research assistant uh, uh, resources required to, to follow up uh, patients. Um, and we also have the ability to track patients long term. Uh, uh, tapping into the provincial data registry, we can check in in 10, 15 years if we want. And another important thing is if there are differences, we can look at cost data because ISIS captures about 85% of all healthcare costs. So big advantages of, of conducting these uh, sort of integrated into the health system randomized trials. I think I'm running a little bit short of time, so I'll just take home messages. Uh, I think it's really important, and we stress this in our work, that RBC transfusions are incredibly safe, and they're also a necessary intervention. And, and in some folk, it's, it's life-saving. And that the research that we're doing on donor characteristics is, is largely focused on optimizing that RBC product. And so while not maybe personalized medicine, but maybe stratified medicine, uh, hopefully we can improve the, the outcomes of the recipients. And at this current stage, I think the observational evidence, uh, uh, certainly with sex, uh, sex mismatch and age really remain unknown. We have, uh, um, um, uh, actually that's not due to, it's due to conflicting results and risk bias. The stuff uh, conducted by, uh, uh, by Edgar and colleagues in, in Scandinavia and some recent stuff by Red Sri, really robust, uh, showing no difference, whereas the Hamilton and Ottawa data is showing some difference. Um, I think we need resolution. And again, hopefully these trials can play a key role. So with that, there's a tremendous amount of people to thank for all this work, uh, you know, the systematic reviews, the observational studies, and, uh, and certainly working with, with CBS uh, for the ITAD study, a lot of people were involved, they gave up their time and, and, and championing of the study and, and, uh, uh, and, and efforts in making the, the blinding and the coding and so forth all successful. So with that, I'll, I'll end there, Dana. Great, thank you very much, Dean. <clears throat> so uh, we're happy to take some questions now. So you can either put your hand up or you can put a question in the in the uh, chat box and I, you, we've already got some questions in the chat box so uh, I'll just uh, read them out for you Dean. Um, Narges is curious how multiple blood product transfusions happen in such studies. Do all or most patients receive only red cells and is there any way to control for any effective transfusion of platelets or plasma? And she's also wondering if uh, trally is analyzed separately as an outcome and she very much enjoyed your talk. Great, yeah, so, so um, the multiple transfusion here, we focused on RBCs. Um, in the observational work, we have done analyses where we're also controlling for other blood products. Um, that is difficult in itself. So all the difficulties of transfusion data that I presented uh, were focused on RBCs, and now you take it to other products such as platelet and some plasma and, and so forth, it, it becomes really, really difficult. So we're still teasing that out in our observational work and trying to make sense of it. So the timing of those different products with the outcomes and, and the different characteristics of, of those products uh, is still very much a, a work in progress. And, and that will hold for the trials as well. For, for our, 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 our ITADS trial, we'll look at the transfusion of other blood products as an outcome because they happen post-randomization and there may be some differences between the groups. Uh, but then we'll also break it down and look at it from an observational point of view. Again, the timing of different products and, and outcomes. But, it's, uh, as, as my dad would say, it's a dog's breakfast. It's really, really, really difficult to tease out. Um, and it speaks to all the, the possible potential work that uh, you know, our trainees and that could sink their teeth into. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Wayne and he was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, about the hazard ratio, how it's calculated, and at what ratio would you consider the risk to be clinically significant? Yeah, okay, so, so um, 
my mistake there. Hazard ratio is a hazard ratio is looking at the hazards of, of, of mortality, one group compared to the other. So that's the ratio part of in the, you know, male, male uh, donor recipients versus female donor recipients. And the hazard ratio is essentially uh, a time to measure. So time to mortality. So it doesn't just capture the, the event of death or not, it also captures the time it happened. And so that, that's a hazard ratio. And uh, typically, uh, you, know, you know, this is very much generalizing that, that a hazard ratio, you know, greater than, uh, uh, you know, 1. You know, 1, 1. 1.15 would be clinically significant. So a 10 or 15% increase in survival or decrease in survival, depending on how you look at it, would be clinically significant. But it depends on the circumstances. Here, if we're taking all patients uh, uh, transfused, then even a very small hazard ratio, so hazard ratio, you know, even uh, two or three uh, percent, uh, if statistically significant, applies to a lot of people because, uh, well, I, I think it's uh, you know. Uh, whatever, 100 million units are, are transfused every year around the, the globe. So that, that you know, two or 3% uh, increase in, in, in survival is important when you apply it to a very big population. And uh, um, yeah, um, uh, so that's why even when, when I'm, I'm going through and you know, hazard ratio of 1.03 or 1.06 are still clinically very important. Great, thanks, Dean. And then we have a question here from uh, Professor Ma, who says, you gave a great presentation. Is it possible to divide the recipients into different groups to see for which conditions the donor sex or age might specifically matter? Is that part of your analysis? Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, we, we've, we've got a, a part of our analytic plan is to do just that, uh, to look at different uh, clinical diseases and, and, and conditions uh, as well as uh, uh, even, you know, sort of subconditions and so forth, looking at a very heavily transfused population from one, uh, you know, uh, a very low risk population, say, you know, obstetrical population that, uh, uh, you know, accounting for surgical misadventures and so forth, were uh, overall, um, you know, not a big impact on, on their health versus somebody who's chronically transfused and, uh, um, so those, those are ideal populations to look at because if there is any effects, then they should be in a heavily transfused population. So yeah, we'll be looking at that. Great. So other questions? Anyone have other questions? So I was just a little bit curious. If I, if I look at the kind of bulk of the literature that we've got, aside from Rutger Middleberg's paper, this looks like a Canadian phenomenon, right? And you know, it's, it seems that something we've found in, at least in how we're, we're engaged in transfusion practice in Ontario. And I, I'm just wondering if you, if you think that, that there's something different about how we're practicing transfusion medicine in Canada, or, or is there potent, just it's a potential confounder and we haven't, you know, we haven't quite figured that out yet. Yeah, this is such a great point because I'm I'm still scratching my head that if we line up, you know, and done in fully independently, uh, if you line up the Ottawa data with the Hamilton data, we're pretty close, right? Like like yeah. you suggested, then we take that uh, across the pond to to Scandinavia, and then uh, uh, again the great work done by by Red Three, um, where they. Th their analyses pretty much match up with the Scandinavian analyses. I, I think if, if I'm correct, I think there is one health system uh, within the, in the States where they found some differences that, that sort of matched with the Ottawa and Hamilton data, but it seems to be Canada versus the world, right? And I'm wondering, it could be in how we transfuse, but it could also be in the underlying donor population, right? That, at a, at a ecological level, there's differences. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, we try to look at sort of the baseline characteristics and they kind of match up, but there's a lot of stuff that we don't account for or don't yep. measure. 
that uh, I'm, I'm wondering if that has something to do with it rather than the analytic method or design or, or whatever it may be. But, Very yeah. possible. It's always more projects to do, Dean. You bet, you bet. Keeps okay, well, yeah. yeah, if uh, if nobody has any further questions, I'd just like to say thank you very much. A really interesting talk, and we're really looking forward to the to the next level of analysis on, on ITAD, so you can hopefully tell us what the answer is. So i uh, just like Great. to say thanks very much, and for those of us who uh, you can either use your applause reactions or if you take yourself off mute and just say thank you so thanks very much team oh uh, thank you thanks for having me and everybody stay safe <laughs>